Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining Alteryx and Capitalize Analytics for today's webcast, Adding Geospatial Components to Your Data with Alteryx. My name is Scott Trothan. I am with Alteryx, and I'm joined today by Sean Heiberg and Eric Soden of Capitalize Analytics. And we're going to go through a couple of different use cases today, as geospatial data tends to be so critical, particularly within oil, gas, and energy industries, it's an important component to be able to add to your data, to your workflows, and we're going to show you exactly today how Alteryx can help you effectively and efficiently add geospatial data so that you can enrich your results and get more information in order to solve some of these challenges that you're facing in, this in, 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 the, in the oil, gas, and energy industry. A few housekeeping items for today. One, you are muted as we are recording this session today. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A tab in the upper right-hand corner of your WebEx session. We will be hosting a live Q&A session at the end of today's webcast. Also, as you are muted and we are recording, we will be sending out a copy of this webcast to everyone who registered. So if you get distracted today, if something pops up, you need to leave the webcast for a little bit, don't worry, we're recording it and we will send you the recording afterwards here. With that, I want to turn it over to Sean Heiberg of Capitalize Analytics to get us started. Sean, take it away. Hey Scott, thanks again for that introduction. Uh, just to kind of go over the agenda for today, um, if you have joined us in the two previous, you're familiar with how this or how we operate. We're going to do a very quick overview of Capitalize Analytics, so I'm going to turn it back over to Scott that can talk a little bit about the Alteryx platform a little deeper. Uh, we're going to tee up a use case where we uh, use geospatial uh, for one of our customers, uh, an actual use case once again, and we're going to demonstrate the workflows from uh, the standpoint of an actual user, not necessarily just uh, sales stuff. These are actual use cases that have been uh, worked on and performed to, to help the business at a number of our different customers. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to get started with the uh, Alteryx platform, and uh, as Scott mentioned, open this up uh, later for some questions and answers. Um, so as I mentioned, this is our third in the series of, of three Lunch and Learns, and if, uh, if you've joined us previously, thank you very much. We have walked through the Alteryx platform in a number of different ways. We initially started with an overview of how um, Alteryx could be implemented to assist with um, Excel data wrangling and then bringing in third uh, party components into that mix as far as an enrichment layer and how to create macros to automatically pull uh, from APIs available from third party uh, components. Uh, we then follow that up with a time series predictive analytics use case where we talked about how one of our customers was using and leveraging Alteryx to assist with their equipment reliability uh, maintenance issues. Um, today, what we have seen, uh, is according or in line with what Scott had mentioned, is there's a number of different use cases for geospatial. One of the pieces and one of the great things about the Alteryx platform is its breadth and its capabilities. Um, geospatial is one of those components that we found is very easy to add into the mix and to your analytics to be able to identify, um, in some cases, how your infill wells are performing to the apparent well. You can look at your land and lease management, determine uh, on a map where those uh, leases are coming up for renewals or those that might be some that you want to bring back in and invest in. Uh, the use case we have today is specific to methane gas leak. It's, very, uh, it's a very interesting use case, and it's one that I think uh, you'll get a lot of uh, insight into how you can add the geospatial component into your analytics. Um, as you know, Capitalize is an enablement partner of Alteryx. We assist with a number of organizations who are looking to better leverage the power of the orchestration capabilities within the Alteryx platform. Um, very easy to work with, very easy to engage. The way that we engage is very specific to a targeted use case. And so instead of coming in and trying to set up six months, 12 month uh, ordeals, we look to help you pull the trigger on a business problem that you are currently having, making it very relevant and impactful. Um, hopefully over the course of these series, you've been able to determine the capabilities and the agility found within the Alteryx platform. Um, and we're gonna continue that today with the geospatial components. But before we do that, let me turn it back over to you, Scott, talk a little bit about the, the platform, uh, introduce the use case, and then introduce our speaker for the day. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sean. For those of you who are just being coming familiar with Alteryx, 
Alteryx delivers an end-to-end -end platform that is flexible enough to satisfy the line of business analysts as well as IT and the data scientists. Collaboration, agility, and an analytic pipeline that is flexible, these are all critical components in achieving analytics at scale across your organization. And legacy platforms, point solutions, fundamentally they lack these properties essential to most modern analytic needs. Altrix delivers a modern end-to-end -end platform that is purpose-built for today's needs. Our platform is comprised of four capability sets that span the end-to-end -end analytics pipeline. The first one, Discover and Collaborate, gives you the ability to find and publish the right data and analytic assets faster in a collaborative and covered environment through data discovery and cataloging. Prepare and Blend allows you to enable, and enable self-service data analytics with drag and drop workflows that allow analysts to connect, prep, and blend all of your data wherever it's stored. Analyze and Model, allowing the analyst to develop advanced analytic models in a code-free and code-friendly environment, leveraging visualytics to see how your data changes across your entire workflow. And finally, deploy and manage, giving the analyst the ability to deploy, manage, and monitor analytic models in real time to quickly and confidently deliver answers faster than ever before. Around this, we give you the ability to scale and govern. Automate, share, and publish analytic workflows securely across your organization, freeing up time and resources to deliver faster insights to the business. We help bring all of your analytic talent and teams together to create a culture of analytics at scale across your organization. Sean, I'm going to turn it back to you to give us a demonstration here, and, and you're popping up the slide right now, about how Alteryx brings self-service data analytics together. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for that, Scott. Um, you've heard us talk quite a bit about the agility and the scalability of the Alteryx platform. We believe that this slide best represents those capabilities. As you can see, um, Alteryx is much more than just a data prep and blending tool. It also has the capabilities of joining to additional data sets, enriching your, enriching your information, providing a platform for predictive analytics, and then it's key, a key component in delivering information down, downstream to consumption layers such as Click, Tableau, Cognos, and so on. Uh, today we're going to focus quite a bit on the, geo, uh, on the geographic analysis um, and those uh, capabilities that are found within uh, the designer license. To set this up, uh, the use case that we're talking about is uh, around the utilities company. Um, this company and this use case was really interesting. It came to us as they were trying to get an idea how they could decrease their cost to uh, redispatch genera uh, generation. Uh, they have tons of data, just like every one of us in, in, the, in the energy and oil and gas space. We are wrangling data on a, a number of different levels and a number of different departments. And this organization decided they wanted to get, to get ahead of that and to be able to combine all this information and create one analytic platform to be able to drive adoption throughout the organization. Uh, the use case here is actually one where they brought Alteryx in and used it as an entire enterprise uh, enablement tool for analytics on a number of different uh, purposes and a number of different lines of business. Um, the use case that we're talking about specifically where geospatial is used as a main component was uh, to determine methane gas leaks. They would dispatch out um, trucks uh, around the different areas, uh, around the different pipelines with, uh, with sensors that would identify uh, any types of methane gas leak. And what they were trying to do was understand where the severity of the leaks were and to be able to get a good understanding of, you know, where they need to dispatch and take a look at the, uh, the um, integrity, integrity of that line and that um, delivery method. So um, what I want to do is I want to turn this over to Eric Soden. Eric Soden is uh, our managing partner of analytics. He has been a key driver of the adoption of Alteryx within our customer base. Um, he has been in analytics for a number of years, all the way from uh, a BI analyst all the way into developing and implementing a large enterprise uh, adoption of advanced data analytics and even into the data science, uh, data science realm. 
Um, Eric comes to us with uh, a, just a wealth of knowledge and is instrumental in the vision of Capitalize Analytics and the technology partners that we that we have brought in, and is a is a big proponent of Alteryx across all of our organizations. So with that, Eric, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to you and let you take the ball and walk us through the use case that we have that we are talking about uh, today. Cool. All right. So I wanted to I want to jump in. I'm going to take you through a handful of use cases. Um, one of the ones I want to, I like to show, and this is this is not specific to oil and gas. If you've not seen this one, I I enjoy this one because it really helps get an idea of what the Alters platform does. If you take a step back and don't get stuck into any one use case. Um, so here, what you're going to see is we're going to be pulling local files. And then we're going to be pre preparing those to be combined with files from our database. So we may have Excel sheets, maybe they're pricing files, maybe there's something we pulled down from something like drilling info or, or open wells or something of that nature. And so we have that. We've got some information in our database, maybe about uh, actual drilling performance or actual well performance, et cetera. And we're going to want to combine those things together. So they're not going to be ready to be prepared. So we've got to, we've got to somehow do something to those so that we can join them together. We also may have specific things that we're pulling down directly from the cloud, whether that's something from salesforce.com, if we've got CRM information, or maybe, again, we have a, a pricing file that we can pull directly from the cloud through an API. We're going to pull that together. We're going to then do some geospatial things. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at, at individual points, so using latitude, longitude. Then we want to uh, group those into specific trade areas or groups of, of wells or leases that we may be evaluating. Uh, if we had demographic data that we wanted to pull in from Experian down in Bradstreet, if we were looking for information about the operators who own those wells or those leases and, and, and evaluate that, um, then we're going to join all that information together. And in this case, we're going to be doing a predictive analytics piece. We're going to be looking at a decision tree um, to figure out whether or not those are specific wells that would make sense or leases that we wanted to go after. Um, we're going to score the new data coming in. So at, every month as we get more production information, more things from drilling info, open wells, whatever, we're going to be then scoring it and then pumping out a, hey, we should be evaluating whether or not we should purchase these leases or we should um, look at, are we going to be, should we be selling something, uh, et cetera. So that, that to me is, is the overall platform where I'm going to be pulling data potentially locally. I'm going to be pulling data potentially from databases. It doesn't matter if it's Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, Microsoft Access, whatever. Um, I can go out and grab that. And I may be pulling things from, from the cloud or Hadoop or other places that, uh, that I'm storing my data. Um, and one of the challenges is I ne it, it never seems like the data comes from a single place. Um, the data is usually in multiple different places. Sometimes they talk to each other by nature. Sometimes they don't. Um, and Alteryx gives me a way to pull, grab, blend all this information together, and then push it through geo and geospatial analytics, predictive analytics, et cetera. Um, and then where am I going to put it? I'm going to then take that and either put it into an Excel sheet, I'm going to put it into uh, maybe Esri or MapInfo, or I'm going to push this off to Mapbox or uh, Google Earth, uh, or I'm going to push it to a database. And then, and then I'm, from there, I'm going to have something like Tableau, Click, Spotfire, whatever, sitting on top of that database which is going to be then reading in the output of whatever I'm doing. So that's, uh, that's the end-to-end -end of, of what this looks like. So let's look at um, some specific examples. And I think what I want to start with is rather than looking at workflows that we've already created, I'd like to show how do you create a workflow from scratch that includes geospatial uh, information. So I'm just going to create a new workflow here. Move this over to the for the first tab, since that's where we're starting. And so now I have a blank canvas, and, and I'm sure you've seen this blank canvas um, either in your own Altrix world or uh, in our prior uh, segment. But step one is going to be I need to get data in. Um, so I can pull data from a directory. If I have a directory of files, I can pull data in just a single file or a database connection. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out here, I'm going to grab a data input. Um, and you'll notice I've got tools all across the top. So if I wanted to create formulas, do filtering, uh, et cetera, I can do that. If I need to join multiple files together, I've got tools to do that, including fuzzy matches. I can parse data, so if I have XML coming in or JSON coming in, or if I need to do regular expressions, text to column, all that stuff. If I need to do summarizations, transposing, cross-tabbing, et cetera, I can, again, do all of that. Um, there's also the ability to do things inside of your database. So uh, we all know that if you pull back 100 million records, it's going to take a while. So if you can filter down in the database before we ever pull that data, uh, it's going to be faster. So you may want to do some filtering in database before you pull the records back to 
um, to Alteryx. Uh, you can do all that with the in-database uh, tools here. And then if I want to send an email based on something, I'm going to use the reporting area. If I want to document what I've done, I can use that. Um, and then I have my spatial tools, which include things like creating buffer zones, creating points, uh, looking at distances, finding the nearest point from one point to another, looking at um, overlaps of specific areas or, or um, specific, uh, oof, losing my words here, specific uh, uh, polygons or polylines. Um, so I can do all that stuff here. Um, there's also obviously all the predictive stuff. So if you've watched the other ones, you want to create neural nets or decision trees or forest models, all that's going to be here, time series, predictive grouping, et cetera. So, we're going to start out with the simplest stuff. We're going to be grabbing a data input. So we've got our data input here. Now over on the left-hand side, I need to select the data that I want to work with. So I'm going to click this little down arrow here. It's going to show me everything that we've worked with recently. Um, so uh, here is the, the Wells CSD that I want to be working with. So I'm just going to click that. Um, or I could browse to it. Um, or if it was a database, I would, I would go into the database. But from here, you can see um, I've got our API number, our lease name, operator name, et cetera. And over on the right, I have latitude and longitude. Um, and so my lat long is going to be obviously what I'm going to be doing geospatial analytics on. So that's what we're going to work with next. I'm going to come up to my spatial area. And from here, uh, I can do a bunch of different things. The first step is going to be I need to create points. So I need to tell Alteryx what are the points that we should be working with. If, in this case, uh, you've named it lat long or latitude and longitude, uh, Alteryx is pretty smart and says you're probably thinking those would be the lat latitude and longitude. Uh, if not, if you have them named something weird, um, underscore lat or something, um, then you'll, you'll click it and just find it out here. So that's going to be generating your points. So now I've told Alteryx what are the, the points that we're going to be generating. Um, from there, I can actually, at, at this point, I could start looking and visualizing that information by bringing out a browse tool. So when I bring out the browse tool, what it's going to do now when I run this workflow, it's going to go out, it's going to fetch the data, um, run it, and then the browse tool is going to create those points for us. Um, I can apply any base map that I want. Uh, I'll just grab one of these. Now you can start to see uh, we are plotting this. Oops, zooming the wrong way. Uh, we are starting to plot this on a map, right? So there's our map. We are in this great state of Texas. Quite a bit of oil and gas action going on around here. So that's it, right? Step one, create a map with the points on it. Now, if I wanted to actually do some kind of analytics on this, maybe I want to find out, um, you know, create a buffer zone and look for anywhere where the, these wells are closer together than I wish they were. Um, so I'm going to come out, I can grab other spatial tools. And so maybe I need to find the distance between the wells, or I need to create a buffer zone between them, or I want to find the nearest well from one well to the next. Um, so I mentioned buffer zones. So let's go ahead and use the buffer tool. So I'm going to create, create a buffer. It, just drag that in and drop it, and it's going to say, okay, um, because you have lat long, you've created points, you can use the centroid of that. If you had multiple centroids, if you had multiple lat long situations, you could certainly use, you pick the one you want. From there, and then I'm going to ask, it's going to ask me what I want to look for. So this is going to be one mile. Um, so I can choose miles or kilometers, but let's not, let's not do one. That's, that's pretty far. Let's go with 0.1 mile buffer zone. So now when I run this, it's going to run, it's going to create those buffer zones. And now I can see um, on the map, instead of individual points, it's creating me my buffer zones. Um, and so now I can see, look, there's some really, you know, tight clustering here. Uh, this may or may not be a problem. Right? Maybe, I could, maybe I'm looking for places I could put additional wells, additional infill wells, um, potentially, right? So there's some areas in here that are looking pretty open. So, again, just, just a very quick way to grab from a file and throw this stuff into a map and begin doing things like, like buffer zones. If I didn't, if I was, you know, if I want to do something other than buffer zones, oops, um, I can do that as well. So let's go ahead and just find the nearest well from, any, from an, another well. So I'm going to grab my points. I'm going to put that my target wells are here um, and that my universe or my overall wells are here. I may have two different files. That's why I could hook this up to two different things. So if I was using one as my wells and then another file as my competitor's wells and I was trying to find how close are my competitors to me, I would put our wells up in the, up in the, the uh, target, and I would put the universe as our competing, competing wells, and that would give me the ability to look at the distance between two points across multiple different files or data sets. 
Um, and so uh, now here what I'm looking at is um, I'm grabbing the records from the universe input. I'm using our centroid field just like we were before. How many points of interest do I want to look at for nearest? I'm looking at one. And then what's the maximum distance I want to reach out? Um, so maybe I only want to reach out a mile or two miles or whatever to find the nearest. If it's beyond that, I don't care. Um, and then one thing that's important is we want to ignore zero distance matches because otherwise it's going to match to itself. Sometimes that makes sense um, and sometimes it doesn't. If, for instance, your target was your wells and your universe were competitive wells or you're looking for operators or something of that nature, uh, working interest uh, folks, uh, maybe you would want to know when there was a, a direct match of the same well that's maybe co-operated by you as well as one of your uh, one of your partners or, or uh, competitors. But anyway, we're going to ignore distances uh, of zero match for us, um, and then we're going to have our matches push out through here, and then we'll be able to browse those. So I'm going to run this. It's going to push that through. So if you think about how I don't even know how long that would take to do by hand, but to look at all those lat longs, compare the file to every other potential spot in that file and then create and find the nearest uh, nearest neighbor. It can take a very long time. Um, and this does it in, in a couple of fraction of a couple seconds. So now you'll notice that when I click on any one of these, it's going to be showing me the target um, or our well as well as the, um, the nearest neighbor. So you can just see as I click on here, the, the colors are jumping around um, and it's showing you which ones are the nearest. And now from there, you can start making some decisions, right? Maybe you need to be looking at, are they too close together? Or if they are close together, what, is, what does that mean? Um, should we be uh, approaching those wells uh, or leases for purchase? Um, is there something that we need to be doing for things that are, that are very close together? You can also do things like drive time. So if you were doing something where maybe you have trucking that are picking up and dropping off from specific uh, tanks, or from, from specific meters, and you have people coming and, and picking things up, you could say, what is the drive time? I want to I wanna route my trucks, uh, but only within a 20-minute drive time uh, radius. And so it will actually look at and use the TomTom -tom, uh, capabilities for traffic, uh, as well as drive time, and then it will figure out what that drive time, um, how it makes sense. So again, those are the basics of how you're going to take something that has lat long, and then put this in here. Another thing that we can do is we can, we can reverse geocode. So if we wanted to find out the address of, of that particular point, um, we could do that. Um, or we can geocode it. If you just have an address, we could push this through, geocode it, and then now we'd have lat long in order to, be do, to do some of the things that we're talking about right here. All right. So with that, I'm going to move on to some, some more complex um, scenarios. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this infill performance one. We do have a more uh, in-detail version of this out on the Capitalize website. So if you go to capitalizeanalytics.com slash webinars, you'll be able to find a pre-recorded um, on-demand webinar talking about this use case and another use case very specifically. I'm not going to go into it in that great of depth. I just wanted to walk you through this use case so that you can get an idea of, of what we're doing. So again, we've got well production. So this is coming from one data source. This may be coming from one of our live data sources. Then we have a, another group of, of information that's that may be coming from another data source, right? It could be coming from something that we subscribe to um, that we don't have access to internally. So that might be coming as a file. It may be something that we can reach out and pull from the cloud. But those two files aren't ready to be connected together. Um, we need to do some work on them. So uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to select and rename and set data types the way we need to. We're going to cleanse that data by getting rid of any null values, any additional white space we don't want. We're doing some sorting to make sure that we're, we're sorting this the way it makes sense. Um, we're doing some grouping, so we're grouping those things together. Down here, we're summing things up. Um, so we're, we're getting the, the minimum, actually what we're doing is we're getting the minimum date, so we're looking for a start date. Then we're joining the start date back to the overall uh, data set so that we have the start date um, identified. We're doing some filtering where in this case we're only looking for the start date or that the start date is, is not too far apart from the, from the production date. We're summing those things up again. We're, we're grabbing, grouping by the well, and then we're doing some maxes on different items as well as some minimums to get the minimum start date. And now we're ready to go. Now we're, with that file is ready to be combined with the file that we have that are, uh, is about all wells. So we grab this file. Again, we set some data types, maybe do some name changing. We join those things together. And now we have a data set that we can work with, okay? So data preparation 
with all analytics, whether it's predictive analytics, geospatial analytics, is, is a large part of this. And it's one of the things that Alters does very, very well. It helps me access the data that I may or may not be able to access easily normally. Then it gives me the ability to prepare it, um, get it ready, get it so that it's, it's, it's able to be worked with the way I want to work with it. And then it allows me to blend it together using joins and unions and other things, fuzzy matches, whatever. Uh, then I'm able to prepare that file even further if I need to, such as filtering, formulas, et cetera. Um, and then now that I'm ready, um, I have this file. It does, it has my start date, which we calculated. It has my latitude, my longitude. And now I'm able to bring that out. Um, and like we said, so I'm going to put in my longitude and latitude. And what I'm doing here is I'm looking for the nearest um, within one kilometer. Uh, of the, cent uh, the centroid, which is the, the place that we started, right, the lat long point, um, and I'm comparing that to the overall group and looking for the nearest, much like what we did a minute ago, but we've done a lot more work on this data set um, than we did in the previous example. Um, then now that I have my matches and I know what the nearest ones are, I'm going to do some additional things. So I take that well, I group it, I um, average out all the other pieces of information, because what I'm trying to figure out is, are there additional wells that I should be looking at? How are the, how are the infill wells comparing to the main well, um, et cetera? And so then I do some additional calculations. And then what I'm going to do is push that data out, uh, back out to uh, either, again, a database. Uh, maybe it's pushing it out directly to Spotfire or Tableau or SQL Server, DB2, Oracle, wherever it needs to go, um, including I may be pushing it to an upstream or downstream um, supplier of ours who needs that data from, from me, so through files or APIs. All right, that's one example. Let's take a look at another one. So this is, uh, this is just doing something slightly different. Um, again, we're starting with, we have a lot of data here. Um, so we've got data from multiple different locations coming in, some from Salesforce, like I mentioned. We've got things coming from uh, systems that are out there that we either have access to or we're subscribing to. We're cleaning up all of that data. We're looking at it, making sure it's all good. Um, in this case, we're doing some different data format or date formatting. Um, we're doing some filtering. We're doing some formulas to create um, things that are ready for us to be able to, to go out. And then now um, we union those two first data sets together. Then we union that union data set with the additional data set. Um, and so now we've got our data down there at the bottom such that we can output that to a file if we need to. Or down here, what we're doing is we're also, uh, beyond just outputting it, we're pushing it through some geospatial information. So here I've got some Google geospatial info coming in that we're then joining back to that original file so that we can create our point. Um, from there, we are breaking that um, into whether they're active or inactive. I'm taking my active um, up to this top, and I'm saying I want to compare active to the overall group, which would be the active and inactive, or the, the inactive ones, to find where is the nearest inactive rig um, that I could utilize if I needed to do some drilling. Um, down here, what it's doing is the opposite. It's saying find um, the nearest um, active rig to the, to the opposite, the inactive rigs. So I'm splitting those into two different things. Um, and then when I click on this, um, it's going to show me either a data profile or a data map. Um, and so this is pulling up a map, and you'll notice now what we're doing is the, the latitude longitudes are across the entire world, right? So we're looking, uh, maybe this is deep sea rigs, or this is a specific, very specific large, um, large rig operation, and we're looking across the entire world and saying, where are the nearest rigs to the rigs that we're working with that are, that are active or inactive? Um, and then we're doing some additional formatting, um, summarizing that information, and then again, we're going to either push that out to uh, to a database for putting it on a dashboard, or we're going to push it to um, one of the tools like MicroStrategy, Cognos, uh, business objects, whatever. So again, one more way to, to take and utilize the tools that are up here in this geospatial uh, grouping for, for what the types of things that I'm doing. In this uh, additional workflow, this is another one that, we've, that we worked on. Um, and so this one, we're, we're looking at permit and you can see that uh, as I open this up, there's all kinds of different information in here um, about each one of these, these specific permits, leases, whatever. Um, and I can see I've got things like my surface latitude and surface longitude. 
um, as well as a bunch of other information. So, but this file isn't ready for me to, to start working on, so I need to do some things with it. So first thing I do is I get rid of any nulls. So if it's null, I'm gonna change that. So clean this thing up a little bit. I'm gonna rename and do some, some specific selecting. So this is just renaming all of my things so that they're in a little bit nicer to, nicer to use um, uh, view in the future. Um, then I'm uh, looking at uh, the well type and I'm, I'm categorizing that well type. Uh, from there, now that I've filtered out so only specific well types that I want, I'm looking at some additional filtering. Um, if that's true, I look at, I'm only interested in looking at the Eagleford, so that, asks, that um, filters out for that. Then now that I've got my data ready, I'm gonna start doing some geospatial analytics. In this case, um, I had to choose surface longitude and surface latitude because um, it, you know, having those additional words may or may not get picked up right away, so I just picked from this drop down which one of these things is left longitude, which one's latitude. It creates the points for me. Um, so as I pull up uh, this map here, it's, it's looking at every single piece of data that was out here, um, figuring out where those points are, and then rendering those points on a map. The, the next thing that it's doing after it creates those points is it's looking at a 70-foot buffer zone around that. So one of the tools out here that you'll notice uh, up here in the top is a buffer tool. Um, if I click on that buffer tool, it's looking and it's saying, show me anything within, again, now this is miles, so we're looking in uh, for 70 feet, so 70 feet, 0 0.013 uh, miles. So show me anything that's within 70 feet of the, um, of the other data. So let me run this one, pull this data through. Um, so you'll notice now it's running. It ran that in 3.5 seconds. Um, so not a tiny data set, but also it's not a ginormous one. So that's done that. Then we're going to be sorting that. We're going to do some fill down or multi-row formulas. Um, then, we're com then we're computing uh, summarization of what the, the different pad sizes. Um, we're joining the, the, the main pad size with the entire set of data. Uh, and then we're going down the line and doing more and more uh, different cleanup so that we can then push that out. So where is that gonna go? Well, one option is you're gonna push this out to a database or a file, and you're gonna bring that into something like we're looking at Cognos right here. So now you can see all those individual points placed on a map, um, and now I have interactive uh, ability to look at where are each one of these things, who, how many are there, the individual color are the, the permitted depth, so I can get a quick visualization now of what is the depth of um, each of these wells and who is who runs these things, right? Who owns these wells? So in this case, EOG Resources. If we want to look at Chesapeake, we click on Chesapeake, it's going to zoom us in um, and show us that specifically. If I only wanted certain well types, um, I can choose well type up here and say, just show me the oil wells um, and everything's going to get filtered. And again, um, I'm having, I have instant access to that data. Now that Altrix gave me the ability to find this information out, which I may not have had the ability to figure out all this stuff um, without it. Um, same thing with Tableau. Um, so here, um, I brought this into Tableau. I zoomed out a little bit so you can see I'm in the state of Texas because as I zoom further and further in, these wells are pretty close together. Um, and I'm looking at the perf interval as the size of the bubble. And then I'm looking at the different colors as the different operators. And so if I'm only interested in certain ones, I just click on them and it's gonna highlight those. So again, the, the Altrix is going to be a great way to grab your data, prepare your data, blend your data, and then be able to analyze that data, build things so that uh, tools like Cognos, like Tableau, um, are able to consume that information and you can begin building dashboards and scorecards and whatever else you're trying to do uh, based on some data that would be very difficult to, uh, to calculate uh, another way. Um, obviously, you can, you can pump this out as, as reshape files. That's another option within here um, is if I was outputting the data <clears throat> rather than going to Excel, what I may do oops, is pump this directly to Google Earth or uh, a GML file or a spatial file with Altrix, uh, a map info file, right? So a lot of different options out here. There's Esri shape files as well as um, personal geo databases for Esri, a lot of different options for outputting your your geospatial information that way. All right, um, next example I wanted to take you guys through is one that uh, Sean mentioned before, which was a, a leak detection 
um, situation. So the, there were readings being taken from the air, uh, vehicles driving around, um, sampling the air, and out, out back, uh, at the end of that, we would get a bunch of information, such as what were the readings for methane, for sulfur, et cetera, um, and then where were those readings taken? And so we have latitude and longitude, as well as a bunch of other information. Um, it's pretty hard to work with this um, as it comes out. So what we wanted to do is say, all right, well, let's, let's take a look at this and see if we can figure out if these methane readings are high in any particular areas. And then if they are, uh, we can either, you know, potentially go sample them for a few more days and see if that continues to be the case uh, and alert people to that, or, you know, maybe there's a leak there and we need to actually go take action. So first thing we, we're going to do is we're just going to tell it to set, set our data types. So this looks at the file since it's coming out of the CSV. It doesn't have any data types set. So we use an auto field um, tool within Altrix that's found under preparation in order to be able to set those data types. Next thing we're doing is we're putting in our latitude and longitude, just like, uh, just like we saw before. Um, I can take a look at where those are um, on a map right here. So here you can see where we are and where those things were taken. Um, if I zoom in further, you're going to notice it becomes more and more clear that these are individual points that are very, very close together on a specific street. So again, as that vehicle was driving, um, these, this, these are the points that were created. I can see my data down here at the bottom um, of, of everything that's going on. Then from there, it's, it's a really a question of what do I want to do? And I'm showing a bunch of different examples here. You probably wouldn't do um, all of these things, but let's just follow this line up to the top. So from the point creation, I came out and I changed a couple things. So mainly here, I just changed the methane to be something else, a different label. Um, then what I did is I, I multiplied the methane times a smaller number just to scale it down because um, now what I'm going to do is take that methane reading. I'm going to turn that into a zone um, of in, in, the, in miles, uh, which is going to create circles on my map. And now what you can see is um, each of those readings have become a circle, and those circles should be pretty similar, right? There shouldn't be a lot of variation. Everywhere I go, there should be approximately the same amount of methane in the air, same amount of oxygen and nitrogen, et cetera. Um, so I would expect these circles to stay pretty similar in size. Um, and so you'll see as we drove across, um, you know, all of a sudden there's a bigger circle. And that means that there was more methane reported there than any of these other spots. Um, as I continue the drive that we did, you can see, again, a couple more spots uh, where the methane was spiked. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a specific interest, right? We wanted to know that. Um, down here, a little different. What we did is we kept the point. Um, so now it's actually sort of looking more like a layered map that you might uh, think about. Um, so we have those buffer zones, but we also have the individual points. Um, as I look over here, what we did is we used the, the um, poly build tool and we took the individual centroids, we grouped those together based on the sequence of time in order to create a polyline. So if you're a geospatial person, uh, you probably know polygons and polylines. Uh, we're creating a polyline right there. And then in this area, we're saying, look at that polyline and give me a buffer zone of 0.1 miles from that polyline, which when we do that, that shows us the area that we sampled. So if we assume that about 0.1 miles is what we were sampling, this is now showing that area of sampling. So you can get an idea of how we're going to start with potentially points. We may build polygons. We may, we may build polylines. Um, from there, we may do things like create buffers, find the nearest, see if there's overlap, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and again, from in each case here, what I'm pushing out um, is a uh, KML file, which is a Google Earth file. Uh, and then finally down here, what I was doing um, was something kind of similar. I was, I was taking a look at um, specifically everything that was um, 0.5 miles from the original reading point. Again, to kind of get me that where did we test? Where did we test specifically? Um, and the neat thing that this does is um, you'll see uh, there's a there's a checkbox down in that tool for the trade area tool that says eliminate overlap. And so what that'll do is it'll create a um, a polygon that does not uh, allow any overlap. So again, zooming in, instead of perfect circles, what we're getting is what area would that reading not overlap with some other reading? 
Um, and if we scroll to kind of the end of this line here, you can see some of them are very close together, so the overlap is very, very small. So we've got clustered readings that are maybe too close together. Um, let me just, here we go. Um, as I get to the end of this, you'll notice that, that this area is larger. So the readings for this spot right here were, were much further apart because of, that we're turning that corner. So this area is not getting uh, sampled as much as, like, say, some of these areas, which are really, really, really close together. Um, and here's an area, right, this whole area is being assumed that it's coming from the readings way down here, which may or may not be uh, accurate. We may need to have somebody go back out and drive that road as well. And then where does this go? Again, you could push this out to Esri. You could push it out to wherever. Um, I pulled it out into uh, Google Earth. And so here you're, you're seeing these two outputs. I grab the, um, one of the outputs, which is uh, if I turn it off, you'll see that, that this is the line, so that poly line that we were looking at. Um, and then this other one is the first thing that we looked at, which are all of the circles, including the, the reading. So I can zoom way out. Um, and if we were doing something very, very, very far away, right, uh, we're going to end up being able to look at the entire planet if we want to or we can zoom way in uh, and look at you know, the data sets that we're specifically targeting. So it really just depends upon what, what you guys are doing, um, where you're looking. So if you're looking in a specific play like the Permian, um, you're going to zoom into that level or, or whatever. Um, so now on Google Earth, I can see very quickly, again, the same, same sort of stuff I was able to see in Ultrix, but not everybody's going to have a copy of Ultrix to be able to look at this. However, Google Earth or, or Esri or something of that nature where I, I can uh, view these things um, right on, on a map or on the, on the Internet uh, is going to be a lot easier for people to, to look. Um, I also noticed, like, right here, there, I don't know if this, the vehicle stopped at a stop sign or what, but you can see that there's a ton of circles right here that are, that are on top of one another. Um, and so that may be giving me, you know, additional readings that I don't need, which I could filter out using Ultrix. Um, or I could also filter for only specific high areas. Um, and have only these larger circles show up uh, within Google Earth. And then, obviously, every, everything else that I can do in Google, Google Earth exists. So if I wanted to maybe take a look at this polyline and follow it, um, you know, one of the options that we do have uh, within a lot of these tools is the ability to, to, to do different functionality that comes out of things like Esri, Google Earth, et cetera. So in this case now, the polyline that I built, because I sequenced it by time, Google Earth is actually taking me through the journey that the person driving the vehicle was using, and I can see how that went down. I can also see every time um, something gets larger, I could pause it at this point if I wanted, um, et cetera. So that is, um, that's how you would integrate what we've been working with with Google Earth. Um, and so. Just jumping back out, um, I'm going to open it up for questions at this point. Um, you can kind of get an idea uh, how this is working. We've got data coming in. We've got something happening in the middle, uh, which may be transposing data, filtering data, doing formulas. We've got geospatial analytics happening. If I then wanted to predict uh, which wells I should go after, which wells are going to fail, where I'm going to have um, shut-ins, where I'm going to have whatever, right, anything of that nature that, that I have historical records for, I can build a predictive model using my geospatial information and then plot that all on a map in Cognos, in Tableau, in Google Maps, in Esri, et cetera. Um, these things can then be published. Um, so I may want to publish this up and have these things running every day. Um, so I could publish this, schedule it to run daily, and have that output to my real-time database you know, or my real-time dashboard that shows our, our drillers or our analysts where they should be focusing their time or where they should be going out and doing additional readings. With that, Scott, um, I have uh, come to the end of my journey. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, uh, and hopefully that, that, you know, kind of build from starting from scratch with a file going through some of the tools and how to, how to get things started, as well as then looking at specific examples that we've, we've built over the course of time has been helpful. Yes, Eric, thank you for taking us through all that. That was a, an amazing walkthrough in terms of what Alteryx can do, not only from just a geospatial 
uh, example, but also from an overall you know, preparing and, and making sure that data is, is clean, that it's usable, actionable, and that you can export it into uh, a, a format or even put it into uh, different environments where, you know, users of non-users of Altrix, for folks, for your members of your team that are not using Altrix, they can still uh, make decisions, they can still view the data, they can make decisions within their business lives here to use that information and to make the right decisions. So that's great. Eric, thank you for that. Uh, Sean, did we have any additional content that we wanted to cover before we go to Q&A? And as a reminder, for those of you uh, online here, you can use the Q&A tab in the upper right-hand corner of your WebEx session to ask a question. Uh, but uh, uh, Sean, I wanted to see if there was uh, additional content before we go to Q&A, or are we ready to go to the Q&A section now? No, I think that was a great overview, Eric. Thank you so much for that. I think what we were able to demonstrate throughout this was how we take something just as simple as the data that we are working with uh, on a regular basis and build out a workflow that is repeatable and scalable to all the different functions that we're looking for. So uh, one of the things that gets overlooked in a lot of these demos is the fact that everything that we're building is something that you can run on demand you can have it scheduled to run um, on a regular basis if it's something that you do midweek every week. You can uh, prepare your data, blend your data, uh, add data. You can then add the geospatial components all within a matter of moments uh, and then begin your analytic journey from there. Um, Alteryx is the platform to be able to automate uh, the bulk of the heavy lifting and the work that's being done. I think we've done a great job over the course of the last three weeks of explaining uh, what do we do? What are some of the cool things that we can do with the data once we get ready for analysis and how Alteryx can enable us to get to uh, the answers that we're looking for quicker, as well as uh, I think what Eric showed um, was a self-service capability. Wait a minute, if I've got uh, uh, all of a sudden a concentration of data and I need to pause uh, what I'm looking at and drill down into that information, that Alteryx has the capability to allow you to get back into that certain area. Uh, to be able to ask and interrogate your data uh, further. Um, I don't think we have any more content uh, for the day. Very interested in any Q&A. This has been a great uh, three-week journey for everybody that has joined us for each one of these uh, webinar series. It's been a pleasure um, working with you. Some of the questions we've received have been great. There's been a lot of, a lot of follow-up and discussion regarding uh, the discovery program and, and how you can get the, an Alteryx license in your hands. And, uh, we've had a, a lot of fun working with uh, a number of those attendees over the past couple of weeks in regards to uh, their specific use cases and, and showing the uh, adaptability and scalability of the Alteryx platform. Um, I don't think that uh, there's more content. Do you have any questions that have popped up, Scott? We do, um, and you answered the one of them that popped up in terms of how to, or, or question on can you schedule the workflows to run on a recurring basis? That was the first one that uh, uh, you answered there, a, a preemptive answer, if you will. And yes, you can uh, use the Altrix server uh, product to automate and uh, schedule workflows to run uh, whenever you need them to, if it, whether it's be on a, on a daily basis, weekly basis, uh, I suppose hourly basis if you wanted to, that'd be, that'd be interesting. But yes, you can uh, schedule workflows to run automatically. And um, second question, uh, you know, Eric, you showed a, a number of, you know, these, these, these workflows that you've built, a number of them are fairly complex. How long did it take you to get comfortable with the geospatial tools in Alteryx? And how did you, how did you go about getting comfortable with them? Yeah. Sure, good question. Uh, so I think with a lot of with a lot of this, whether it's predictive side, even even the data prep and blend side is is it's one, it's having a challenge that makes sense for the tool, right? So if you don't have a geospatial problem, there's no reason to figure this stuff out, and it would be a lot harder to figure it out when you don't need it. Um, but once once you're given a file that has latitude and longitude in it, or you're going to geocode something and get that latitude and longitude, now all of a sudden it, it's what what exactly are you trying to get to? Are you trying to find you know, like wells, are you trying to find, you know, areas that you guys could invest in and whatever. And so as you sort of articulate that problem, either to yourself or somebody articulates it to you, then you start thinking, okay, how, how, do, I, how do I find the nearest well to a previous well? And, and then now we have a real, a real kind of true use case. Um, and from there, you pull that data in. And, and what I found, 
when I first started having geospatial use cases is that once I had a use case, it was very easy to grab these tools out. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to show in the very beginning how you start from nothing. Because as long as you've got latitude and longitude, you create your points. Now, all of a sudden, you can look at the rest of those tools at the top. Um, Ultrix does an amazing job of documenting each one of the individual tools within the spatial area, um, as well as giving examples. And then you can also go out on the community, and there's a lot of information out there of what people have been doing. So I guess long story short is with, with, a, with a use case that's not insane, um, it's pretty easy to grab your files or your, or your, from your database, pull that in, set the points, and then say, show me, find me the nearest neighbor, or, or show me a trade area that has um, things that are like this within five miles. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think my first geospatial uh, problem pro was, was something pretty simple where I was trying to put things on a map in order to visualize in Cognos, and it, it took me a couple of hours working in Altrix to get it working the way I wanted it to. Um, and then as we've done more and more complex projects, um, some of those things take, take a little longer. But, but truthfully, I think what takes the longest time is getting the data ready, right? Doing all the prepping and the blending and pulling from multiple sources and making sure everything's ready to go. And then when you start snapping on the geospatial tools at that point, it, uh, it's, that's really not the most complex piece of the whole thing. Perfect. Eric, thanks for, for that answer. And, and yes, to reinforce what Eric said, uh, the Altrix community, uh, which you can reach off our website, is uh, a valuable resource for folks who are looking to learn more about how Altrix is being used in different use cases, not just in oil, energy, uh, oil, gas, and energy, but also uh, for, you know, uh, uh, the other aspects uh, in other industries, and, and also uh, specifically when it comes to different departmental analytics, whether you're in finance, uh, whether you're in marketing or sales, uh, you're in operations, uh, there's a lot of good answers and a lot of interaction within the Ultrix community, so definitely encourage people to visit uh, the community off of the Ultrix website and uh, to learn more about uh, how do you, about how people are using the Ultrix platform and also to uh, receive and, and be able to sign up for additional training. Um, final question that I see coming in here, Sean, and, and I, I, you might want to um, uh, flash up some contact information here for uh, yourself and for Capitalize because it's, uh, it's the standard question we get in terms of uh, love what Eric has built, can we get uh, or, or get a closer look at some of the workflows uh, that uh, Eric has showed today. Uh, I figure the best way for folks to do that is to reach out to Capitalize and uh, set up some time to talk with you and Eric here one-on-one. -on -one. So um, perfect. Sean, I'll let you talk to this here. Yeah, that's ex exactly right. Thanks, Scott. And as I was referring to earlier, we have had a great uh, month of June here. Started off with uh, with Inspire out in California. Hope some of you were able to attend that. We followed that up with a very good uh, use case description from one of our consultants working at an upstream producer. Uh, we married that with an offshore drilling company and their predictive analytics back on uh, June 21st. And then we capped it off today with uh, a really good geospatial example from Eric. Uh, a couple of you have already uh, taken us up on our working sessions. Uh, the way that this works is you will be in contact uh, with me and or your Alteric sales rep. Um, let us know if there's a set of data that you have that you've been working with that you'd like to see apply to one of these features. We can apply the geospatial to it. We could also work with you on the predictive side of the house. It's very, uh, very tactful very relevant to what you're trying to do, and it provides an opportunity to be able to learn more about the Altrich product, um, as well as uh, get to the insights that you're looking for. Um, I think Scott had mentioned this, every single one of these have been uh, recorded, and what we are going to do is uh, share those recordings with you, both in emails directly in response to your registration, as well as out on the Capitalize Analytics website, um, as well as on the Altrix website. Uh, if you would like, here is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me directly as well. Um, definitely work hand in hand with Alteryx and would love to assist with the different projects that you are working on. I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, the last couple of weeks. I, I believe it's been a it's been a great journey and it's been something that has been 
uh, very interesting to both capitalize as well as alter it as we see um, analytics uh, becoming more and more part of a data-driven culture within the oil and gas and the energy sector. Um, we believe that when you start looking at the data that's out there and how this can help you move your business and, and, and be able to apply alterics to do your job easier and quicker, um, we believe that this is just revolutionizing how analytics are being completed or being done um, within this sector. This has been very exciting. Um, again, my contact information is here. It's also in the registration links. Feel free to visit our websites, uh, alterics.com and capitalizeanalytics.com. Um, for further information about the two separate companies. Uh, Scott, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we put a bow on this series? I think we can put a bow on it. That, uh, uh, that finishes Q&A, and looks like we have got all questions answered. So on behalf of Capitalize Analytics and Alteryx, I want to thank uh, both Sean and Eric for joining us here again today. Very much appreciate uh, all of your expertise, your insight here. Uh, you have a number of, of really great great customers in oil, energy, and gas. You've been doing a lot of uh, quality work uh, in building up their, their analytics practices and, and building up the analytics journey for them. Uh, and we've, we've featured and highlighted a number of those use cases here in this webinar series. So just want to thank everyone for uh, joining us, uh, whether it was for this webinar and, and maybe uh, some of the other earlier ones as well. I want to thank you for investing some time, uh, and hopefully you gained uh, some good nuggets of value out of uh, the discussions here that we've had over the last few weeks. Uh, Eric, Sean, thanks again so much. Really appreciate it, and uh, thanks again to everyone for joining. We'll catch you on down the trail.